Benvenuti. This is the Italian News and English podcast for mid-November 2012. Mi chiamo Gio, reporting today on this feature story. According to the Italian news agency ANSA, Italian President Giorgio Napolitano said this week that when Italians go to the polls in March to select Prime Minister Mario Monti's successor, there is a risk that Mr. Monti's difficult work to rein in the nation's staggering 1.99 trillion euro debt through austerity measures and more diligent tax collection could be undone. But shall we not vote for this reason, Napolitano asked rhetorically? The president added that Monti's unpopular nationwide budget cuts are not only necessary, but put Italy on a path forward that the nation cannot leave. ANSA reports that while Napolitano met with the German and Polish presidents in Napoli on Monday the 19th, with the three releasing a joint statement that Europe will overcome the economic crisis, angry protesters in Naples threw eggs, tomatoes, and smoke bombs at police, questioning the need for the Italian people to suffer tax increases and cuts in public sector jobs, education, health care, and other social programs, while corrupt and greed appear all too common among the country's wealthiest, most connected citizens. Italian police in riot gear blocked entrance to Palazzo Reale, where the heads of state were meeting. The Courier della Sera reports that violent protests by thousands have taken place recently all across Italy, including in Roma, Milano, Trieste, Torino, Brescia, Padua, Genova, and Pisa, with police suffering injuries, including in Torino, where an officer was attacked by two protesters wielding a baseball bat and a pickaxe handle. None of the injuries was life-threatening. In Roma, police employed armored vehicles to gain control of the crowd, which, according to the Courier, student organizers say numbered as high as 50,000. But while the protests flare up, die down, and flare up again, Napolitano argues there is no alternative to painful cuts in spending, and that all Italians must share in that pain. According to ANSA, Napolitano said, the public debt costs us 80 billion euros in interest every year. Do you realize what we could do with that money? We have to have a realistic view of our growth prospects. The debt is a weight that we need to get rid of with austerity policies that aim to reduce spending, more so than with policies that will only worsen the tax burden. For his part, Monti, who was appointed premier by Napolitano following the costly, chaotic, and often embarrassing years under media mogul Silvio Berlusconi, Assuming office during the darkest days of the Euro crisis, Monti continues to say he has no intention of seeking to retain his office in the spring. ANSA reports that Monti, instead, has been seeking to allay fears over a return to chaos and even greater instability in the Italian economy by stating publicly that the next administration will do even better than his in helping Italy reduce debt inspire new confidence in investors, and play its role in stabilizing Europe. Napolitano has also tried to put on a happy face, suggesting that the country's political parties will not cave to public pressure this spring and promise to undo the austerity measures as a means of gaining office, while at the same time, along with his counterparts from Germany and Poland, Napolitano is expressing faith in Europe's future. At a time when many look at Europe with uncertainty, in which Europe does not look capable of fulfilling its promise of a just society, we, the heads of state of both new and old EU member nations, wish to send a message of encouragement, the joint statement read. And yet Napolitano acknowledges, according to ANSA, that the austerity measures intended to get Italy's debt under control cannot remain in place forever and that there is a limit to how much can be cut in services to the Italian people. The meeting in Napoli and Napolitano's comments come just a week after Civil Service Minister Filippo Pastroni Griffi announced the elimination of more than 4,000 national government jobs, as well as the cutting of nearly 50 high-level managers and 400-plus mid-level managers, all told cuts that will save Italy about 350 million euros a year. ANSA reports that Mr. Monti has placed the total government job loss due to budget cuts at about 24,000 ultimately, with only about 8,000 of those workers who might qualify for early retirement benefits. 
And earlier this month, Ansa says, a report from the diocese in Milano revealed that the number of people seeking help regularly from the church with basic human needs like food and shelter has increased fourfold over the last 10 years, with two-thirds of what Ansa calls the chronically poor being women and three-fourths of all those seeking help being of working age. Highlighting the plight of immigrants in Italy, nearly 75% of those in need, according to the Milano report, are foreigners struggling to survive. So as late fall turns into winter across Italia, the Italian people seem to be caught in this unpleasant conundrum. What leading Italian and European officials say Italy must do to restore economic stability and secure its future prosperity, drastic government spending cuts, will make life very difficult for the Italian people in the short run with high unemployment, an increased cost of living, and less education, health care, and other social services essential to quality of life. And with this spring's election, Napolitano, Monti, and other reform-minded technocrats are holding out hope that the Italian people will vote freely for even more pain now and pleasure later. We'll see. We'll be back in less than one minute with news briefs from across Italia. That was a portion of the 2011 release, National 36, by Calabresi American artist Phil Angotti of Chicago. Angotti's music is available for purchase on iTunes by searching for Angotti, A-N-G-O-T-T-I. And now, these news briefs. ANSA reported on November 21st that a Romanian immigrant lacking the funds to return to his native land attempted suicide by laying on the railroad tracks at Piacenza Station, just outside Bologna, in central Italy. But miraculously, he survived the attempt when an Italian regional train passed directly over him. He had positioned himself inside the tracks, between the rails, and so the train continued on, not knowing the man was there, but leaving him unharmed. Ansa says the man told police afterward, I wanted to go back to Romania, but I had no money and no one would help me. Protesters engaged in a hunger strike until the federal government restored funding for disabled Italians requiring assistance in their battle with Lou Gehrig's disease, won a government commitment to raise 400 million euros for the cause, Ansa reports. Patients from all across Italy gathered at the Economy Ministry in Roma last week to protest the cuts in aid, some with battery-powered respirators. Organizers say many of the patients were willing to die right there to call attention to the human cost of the budget cuts. Following a meeting with government officials, organizers said the increased funds will provide wheelchairs, assistance with feeding, and respirators for those in need. Lou Gehrig's disease attacks nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord, preventing movement in those stricken. ISAT, the Italian National Statistics Agency, recently surveyed about 20,000 families about their happiness, finding that on a 1 to 10 scale, 10 being the most satisfied with your life, the average Italian is now at 6.8 versus 7.1 in 2011, ANSA says. 
ANSA reports that increased social divisions and bigger inequities between conditions in Italian regions were also found. 47% of Italians say they cannot afford a one-week holiday each year. 18% say they do not have the money to properly heat their homes, and more than 12% say they cannot afford to feed their families meat or fish more than three times per week. But one bright spot, Ansa says, is that the economic crisis has helped bring family and friends closer together, with 94% saying they are happy with their family interactions and 81% with their friends. In Venezia, the autumn of 2012 and its aqua alta, or high water, will be remembered as even more challenging and damaging to the long-term health of the city than usual. On November 11th, about 70% of the old city was flooded as heavy rains brought the water to 5 feet above sea level, according to the Telegraph. ANSA reports that flooding of this magnitude has only been recorded six times, including the recent flood, since 1872. Even as the level of the Adriatic began to drop after the rain slowed, powerful winds continued to drive water into the city, leaving tourists wading through water above their waists and hundreds of local businesses shuttered, facing a major cleanup. Genoa, Pisa, Firenze, and Cinque Terre also suffered serious flooding, but Venice, with climate change heating up the Adriatic, causing it to rise, and the city's 100-plus islands, built on oak pylons centuries ago, slowly sinking into the muck, one has to wonder how much this magical little place, once a great and proud republic, can take. Still, tourists and locals seem to make the best of it, to find a way to endure taking a swim in Piazza San Marco and toasting the city with Prosecco glasses held carefully above the floodwaters. City officials in the northern Italian city of Verona in Veneto say they will soon pass a law cracking down on tourist behavior at the famous Casa di Giulietta, which popular folklore, certainly not corroborated, says was once the home of the Capello family, which might have served as Shakespeare's model for the Capulet family in Romeo and Juliet. While Juliet Capulet was not a real person, the legend surrounding the home, including the balcony, which was constructed in the 17th century after the play was written, helps bring millions of tourist euros to the city, combining the popularity of Shakespeare's play with the rich history and beauty of Verona, and spawning desperate letters from around the world, seeking Juliet's advice on matters of the heart, not to mention popular movies and books. The new law will prohibit tourists from using gum or sticky paper to affix notes to Juliet to the courtyard walls or small cave that serves as an entrance to the courtyard. It will also ban graffiti in the cave and public consumption of food or drink in the courtyard. Violators will face a 500 euro fine according to city officials. The Courier reports that Verona's mayor, Flavio Tosi, supports the measure fully. We've decided to enact a law that will sanction anyone who indulges in this kind of behavior, Tosi said. A sign will be put up telling tourists where they are allowed to post their messages, that is, on the removable panels that we have provided. ANSA reports that Bolognese bakers have set a new world record this month after creating a chocolate euro that weighs 1,400 pounds with a diameter of almost 7 feet. Standing about seven inches tall, the creation earned the Guinness Book of World Records designation for the biggest chocolate coin, Ansa says. Completed at Bologna's Choco Show 2012, the coin is made of chocolate from the Dominican Republic and Peru and was created by four Italians, Renato Zoai, Angelo Sodero, Luigi Derniolo, and Domenico Falcone. And as if that story's not already sweet enough, Guinness reports that Alberto Di Leonardis, who hatched the scheme, did it to help raise money to rebuild a school that was destroyed in an earthquake earlier this year. Bravo, Alberto! A developing story just in on the morning of November 22nd from Roma. The Associated Press reports that 50-plus Lazio football fanatics with their faces covered with motorcycle helmets cornered a group of Tottenham supporters from England in a Campo di Fiore pub and beat the English fans with metal rods, belts, and bolts. The attack took place the night before the two sides were to square off in Roma in a Europa League match. 
The AP reports that seven English visitors were hospitalized, ranging in age from 20 to 60 years old, and that one victim was stabbed outside the pub after the beating. The owner of the bar, Marco Manzi, told the AP that although the police maintain a regular presence on Campo di Fiore, a popular nighttime drinking spot, police appeared to be slow to respond to the attack, which also trashed his bar. There was a total absence of law enforcement, Monzi said. They, the attackers, threw everything at them. Police say they responded as soon as they could and detained about 50 of the thugs while others managed to get away. To me, in the wake of such an ugly, violent incident of hooliganism, the whole world is watching Lazio and Roma with hope for a clear, strong response to this brutality, something harsh that might help prevent future assaults. And finally today, defending Serie A champion Juventus of Torino took down defending European champion Chelsea of the English Premier League on November 20th, a 3-0 drubbing with goals by Qualiorella, Vidal, and Giovinco, and a clean sheet for keeper Gigi Buffon and his defense, a convincing win for Juve at home that led the next day to the firing of Chelsea manager Roberto Di Matteo. With one more group match remaining for Juve versus Shakhtar Donetsk, the Ukrainian team, the Italian side need only avoid a loss to secure its place among the final 16 competing for the European club title in 2013. An exciting and well-deserved victory for the best side in Italian football. That's all for this week's Italian News and English podcast. We welcome your comments on stories from this or previous episodes. Follow Geosphere. G-I-O-S-P-H-E-R-E on Twitter and send your comments via tweet or direct message. Thanks for joining us. And to our American subscribers, Happy Thanksgiving. Grazie mille e ciao.